A campaign of lies can hide anything. And with the magic of disinformation, mysterious deaths can be quickly brushed off as suicides, even when all of the details don't add up. And there's so many stories now that just don't add up. Public assassinations can happen right in front of you, and you'll never know who was really behind it or why, as long as the powers that be push a great narrative. The same lie over and over and over again. Jeffrey Epstein infiltrated the highest ranks of every sector of power. You are going to learn a lot about the world today. He was into law enforcement, art, Wall Street, Silicon Valley, big business, real estate, philanthropy, media, academics, and banking. He even wormed his way into high fashion. He hung out with Nobel Prize winning scientists and billionaire arms dealers, movie directors, famous actors, journalists, and lots of politicians, including heads of state, not just here in America. And he has a very special bond with Bill and Hillary Clinton. We still don't know who took part in his many crimes, and they are vast. This is nothing short of political terrorism, theater facilitated by the media. Today's guest, as you will hear, I just finished it, and you will hear halfway through, I say, maybe it's halfway through, I said, I think this is the most important hour I have ever been a part of in broadcast. I've done this for 45 years. This is the most important person and hour you can you can spend. Today's guest has a gift for locating power and hunting it in its darkest corners. She realized that Epstein was not an anomaly an anomaly. She is somebody who has written Two volumes on just him, but you will see it is connected to entire networks of power and influence, a web of elites who operate under the principle that rules are for other people. Her two volume book, One Nation Under Blackmail, the sordid union between intelligence and crime that gave rise to Jeffrey Epstein is out. Keep your eye on this one. She is sharp. She is a massive threat to powerful people. If people will listen and do their own homework and just explore what she's saying, the game is up. She's the kind of writer who reminds the elites that they're not actually above rules and we're not all a bunch of rubes. Please welcome Whitney Webb. Welcome. I am a huge fan of your work. Um, uh, you have covered some of the most important stories, I think, um, in my lifetime. Wow. Uh, Thank you. And you are so clear on all of them. And most of these stories are the ones you can't get answers on. They're, they're all the stories that the big and powerful want to hide, want to you to not see what's really going on and it's it's so frustrating because it's clear that these things are happening and should be discussed are you are you worried ever about your safety um no and the reason i say that is because i think you know um a lot of what we're facing is an energetic and, and spiritual uh, battle, I yeah, guess you so could I. say. And, um, I think in order, you know, if you're afraid of, of these people, yeah. um, you're giving them power over yeah. you. And, uh, I think really the only way to, um, to win this is to have your commitment to, you know, what you're fighting for the good about humanity to be total. Right. So wow. good for you. How, how old are you? Uh, 33. <laughs> you, you write and think and speak like you're 80 and very wise. <laughs> Thank you. you. Must have a good parents. Um, okay, so I want to talk to you if we can in an hour. I want to mention Bitcoin, get a little bit of that. Journalism, transhumanism, 
ESG, the World Economic Forum. We're not going to be able to get to all of it, but we have to start with Jeffrey Epstein Mm -hmm. because the way you have written about him, it connects to a whole world of corruption. Yeah. Is he kind of the Rosetta Stone? Yeah, I think it's sort of like a meta scandal. You're looking at someone who really had, I guess, for lack of a better metaphor, had his hands in a lot of pies, right? Yeah, right. So he was sort of at the center of a lot of scandals, but not necessarily at the top, right? I think he was more maybe middle management in a sense, but very central to a lot of these things going on that sort of these um, networks in which he... Um, in which he inhabits are involved in, you know, numerous uh, acts of corruption simultaneously. Yeah. And he, you know, is there involved in many of them, but not necessarily at the top level. Right. So was he was he a spy? I think he definitely had intelligence connections. And there's a lot, um, you know, to suggest that was the case. I think one of the most uh, the earliest hints we heard of that was having a secretary of labor, Alex Acosta, under mm-hmm. Trump, uh, say that one of the reasons he was pressured into giving Epstein a sweetheart deal, deal during his first um, arrest in, in Florida was because he, he had been told by unspecified actors that Epstein belonged to intelligence. But that's kind of, you know. What exactly does that mean? Was he an asset? Was he on the payroll? Which intelligence agency? Multiple intelligence agencies? Right. When you have his close association with someone like Ghislaine Maxwell in the mix and her father had affiliations with numerous intelligence agencies, you know, it really is an open question. He was kind of a bad guy. Yeah. I mean, I'm <laughs> yeah. reading your work about him and explain who he was. Uh, So Robert Maxwell was involved in many things, uh, but he definitely played a major role in undermining U.S. national security by selling bug software to nuclear laboratories in the United States. Um, And this was directly facilitated by well-known statesmen in U.S. history, like Henry Kissinger, for Mm. example. And a lot of the people I think that enabled him, at least on the U.S. side, tend to be those that uh, favor global governance and, you know, um, mm-hmm. they kind of don't want the U.S. to have that kind of monopoly on on power. Because all of his family, they were killed in the Holocaust, right? Right. Mm-hmm. And so uh, he he's in the West, England. Mm-hmm. Uh, he survives, becomes kind of uh, William Randolph Hearst of England. Would yeah, media mogul, sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and then betrays the West. And that's not because he, gets, he was on the yeah. other. He wasn't on the Soviet side. He was on a global government side. Well, I think there you have to look at this network and they've evolved over time. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, Robert Maxwell is very close to the Eastern Bloc. He had a very close relationship with intelligence figures in the KGB and also Bulgaria. He had a relationship with British intelligence and Israeli intelligence mm. and was involved in aspects of uh, what later became known as Iran Contra, which, of course, involves aspects mm. of U.S. intelligence. So, I mean, he had his hands in everything. you know, everywhere and everything. And it, I think ultimately people like him are interested in. Uh, any deal they can make to advance their money and their power and their influence, they'll take it. So Robert Maxwell was very interested in having his family be like the Kennedy family, a political power dynasty. Um, And that's part of why he started moving into New York City around, you know, just a year or two before he ended up dying. And Ghislaine Maxwell was sent to New York sort of to be his emissary. Um, Wow. Into the U.S. And he wanted her actually to marry a Kennedy. And this is attested to in, you know, past mainstream media reports. And, you know, you can see his, his efforts to get her close to, I think, uh, one of the sons of Robert F. Kennedy um, and also John, uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. trying to get her sort of in that social social tier because he sort of saw that as, you know, w- would advance his power and also, you know, that of his children. And I think if you look a lot at the psychology of Robert Maxwell, he seems to have had narcissistic elements and that could be because of the trauma um, of his past. And a lot of times narcissistic parents see their children as extensions of themselves. Yeah. And so, you know, that he's looking at how to build an empire and using uh, his children to that effect. And you sort of see that with the psychology of Ghislaine Maxwell so as is well. Ghislaine, uh, it was she part and parcel of from the beginning or was she uh you know kind of a good girl idealistic comes over here you know knows that dad wants to put her into powerful positions but 
not shopping women? I, I think it's a lot more complicated than that. You have to look at her early history. Um, the favorite son of Robert Maxwell was originally Michael Maxwell. He uh, was in a vegetative state after a car crash, I think, when he was 15. Mm. And that happened shortly after, just a few days after Ghislaine was born. So new, her family members and she herself have attested to that she was basically neglected for the first three years of her life and even developed a childhood anorexia. Things like that. And then, you know, not a few years after, she becomes the favorite child. So she goes from having this complete lack of parental attention to being sort of showered in it mm -hmm. by Robert Maxwell. Mm -hmm. And that obviously has, is going to have a psychological impact on someone. And in um, addition, there's a, she was basically uh, managed by her father from a very early age. He managed her, uh, tried to manage her romantic life. He tried to manage what job she would have, and she was very dependent on him. So when he is dead in 1991, it makes sense that she would attach herself to someone with a lot of the similar, similar mm. characteristics, right? So <laughs> dad didn't know about... Uh, Jeffrey Epstein wasn't alive at that point? Well, the allegation have been made by people that worked with Robert Maxwell um, in the 80s that um, Jeffrey Epstein was seen in his offices frequently in the United Kingdom. And during that period of time, it was known that Epstein was active in the United Kingdom. He was allegedly being mentored by a British arms dealer named Douglas Lease with uh, British intelligence connections. God. Uh, first of all, you wrote two volumes on yeah, this. Yeah, a thousand pages. Yeah, I mean, that is crazy <laughs> amounts of work. Yeah, and I had my son was born in the middle of it, so it was really <laughs> crazy. <laughs> you yeah. were there for that, I imagine, <laughs> when your son was born. Um, so tell me, a thousand pages, and it's not, there's no fluff in it. I mean, it is. It's dense. It's very dense. Mm -hmm. Why is it nobody else is reporting on this? Um, well, I guess I could, I, I don't really know exactly why that would be, but the, the silence is very eerie about major aspects of the Epstein case. Um, you know, it ended up being a thousand pages because I was, as I was writing about Epstein, a lot of the connections uh, that came up, I was, I was just, you know, increasingly aware that a lot of people in the American public, um, you know, a lot of the names I was coming across, most people weren't going to be familiar with. Correct. You know, um, banks like the Bank of Credit and Commerce International or BCCI, the scandal that involved, or even things like Iran Contra, people may have heard the name but don't really know what it involved. Mm -hmm. So I figured I was going to have to go back and sort of right. um, explain that to people. So that type of con context is a uh, volume one of the book and um and also the history of sexual blackmail and how it's been sort of an undercurrent in some past political scandals um, in American history and how in, in these sorts of networks in which Epstein was inhabiting that type of practice and exploitation even of minors for those purposes was actually um, disturbingly common. So Epstein starts to look less and less of a, uh, you know, he's not an anomaly, basically. Right. Um, by the time you get through with volume one. And so volume two is sort of my effort to, um, you know, dig up as much as I could, you know, with stuff that's uh, publicly available really um, about Epstein and also uh, his greatest benefactor, Leslie Wexner, and then also, uh, you know, Ghislaine Maxwell. Okay, so, so uh, th this is just... There's a lot to discuss. There's so. <laughs> a lot to discuss here on just this because it's, this goes to the deep state, or you call it um, deep politics. Um, mm -hmm. And it's been going on for a long time, but people, I don't think, realize that, you know, the Bourne identity, you know, those Jason Bourne movies, mm -hmm. that that is a reflection of some people's real lives. I mean, it's a, it's a totally mm -hmm. fictitious story, but those things do go on. And, and I, I, I tell you, I have... I have felt for a long time with the just with the NSA listening to everybody's phone calls. If you're important in Washington, they're going to do everything they can to manage you, to manage you. Yeah. And so if you're not rock solid in who you are and what right and wrong really is, they got you. Yeah. But even they don't, you know, today, I think we've moved away from the type of model that Epstein used for sexual blackmail it's an era of electronic blackmail and you don't even have to do anything wrong they can just plant it on your devices and play gotcha that way so it's really an unprecedented situation and a lot of these intelligence agencies 
as I note in the book, you know, really for decades have been totally out of control. Um, and, you know, I really start off the book talking about how intelligence agencies and organized crime in the U.S. got in bed together and really mm -hmm. that symbiosis. Um, you know, it was originally justified out of wartime necessity during World War II. Fighting but it, the Nazis. It, yeah, but it never stopped, right? Right. And it's, um, you know, business is business. And some of these people in our own national security state, you know, realized they could make a lot of money working with organized crime and really shielding them and... Uh, getting in on the spoils, I guess you could say. You know, we think of, in my idealistic years of thinking about America, I thought, well, we did some bad things, yes, and I'm not talking about slavery or anything else. I'm talking about things we did in war. Mm -hmm. But we had, you know, we really didn't want to do those things. I'm not sure if any of that is true. Are the people involved in this stuff, do they recognize at all that this is evil or is this just business? Well, I think when you're talking about in, uh, intelligence agencies, there's hierarchies. So there's like people maybe low in different levels that may think what they're doing is right and advancing American right. interests. But then there's people at the top that aren't necessarily like that. And it's about advancing their own interests. If you look at a lot of controversial um, intelligence operations and decisions, coups, for example, of the past, a lot of it was justified as um, going against communist influence, trying to, to keep right. that from growing. Um, but then some some of these same actors, like the Iran-Contra types, mm -hmm. uh, they ended up getting involved with the Chinese government just a few years later in the 1990s. And some of this blossomed into what a lot of conservatives today remember as Chinagate during the right. Clinton administration and things like that. So, right. you know, they really have no allegiance to anything except uh, their desire to grow their own money and power. Are we ever going to find out who's in the black book? I don't think so. I think the FBI has been compromised from the very beginning. Uh, in the book, I talk a lot about J. Edgar Hoover. He was blackmailed by the mob. He uh, realized the power blackmail had, started using blackmail himself. Um, and, you know, increasingly the FBI, and I think it's very obvious to a lot of conservatives now, uh, comes in to cover things up and to, you know, go after, uh, you know, uh, figures that they, you know, don't want to advance right. in their careers or, you know, any sort of thing. It's, it's very... Um, it's very complicated. So what do we do as a country when, you know, there needs to be massive investigations of all sorts of stuff, Jeffrey Epstein being one, and, you know, the government is increasingly capa incapable of investigating itself, especially right. when you're looking at the FBI or something. Can we just go through some names like Alan Dershowitz and Bill Clinton and Donald Trump? What were they involved in? Uh, so... And so each of those cases is really different. But if I'm looking at, you know, I guess the one that's gotten the, mo the, gotten the most attention, obviously, are the former presidents, right? Trump right. and Clinton. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the Clinton-Epstein relationship is much more damaging than the Trump-Epstein relationship. But there, you know, are, are obvious reasons for concern uh, in both of them. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's, uh, you know, I, in, in, in trying to be objective, you know, I can't absolve so, one or the other. But, but are but, you mm -hmm. saying... Are, are you saying because one is more damaging? Because people don't understand. It's not just the horrific evil sex trafficking mm -hmm. that was going on. It's also massive corruption and financial and crimes. financial crimes and and that's particularly glaring with the epstein clinton relationship you have someone like jeffrey epstein that described himself in the 80s as a financial bounty hunter he was hiding or finding looted money for powerful people that's coming from him and he said this to numerous people there's numerous sources attesting to this so obviously he was very comfortable with the offshore financial system shadow banking and all of that mm -hmm. and then in the late 80s um in addition to becoming involved with Leslie Wexner's finances, uh, he is involved in orchestrating one of the largest Ponzi schemes in U.S. history. Uh, the other person he worked with in that, Stephen Hoffenberg, uh, you know, is arrested and goes to jail for that in 1993. Epstein's name is dropped from the case, and he ends up at uh, Clinton White House fundraisers. Uh, and one of those fundraisers is uh, involved Hillary Clinton's effort to alleged effort to refurbish the White House. And this makes a brief appearance in Vince Foster's quote unquote suicide note. The only mention of Hillary Clinton in that suicide note is relating to her and Khaki Hawkersmith redecorating and how there was nothing wrong with the finances there. Um, if you're mm. um, 
you know, listeners are familiar with uh, the Vince Foster situation yeah, yeah. and how Hillary Clinton and her office was involved in finding the suicide note when there was nothing in the briefcase and all of that later. It's very interesting. The only mention of her name would be in trying to absolve that particular fundraiser of, you know, any wrongdoing, and which would have been was... Foster's responsibility. And that's Jeffrey Epstein's, you know, one of his first interactions with the White House. There's a picture of him shaking hands with Bill Clinton at that fundraiser uh, donor reception. And uh, only UK media covered that when it came out last December. I got to tell you, it's I, pretty stunning. I, I only see stuff that I kind of trust from UK. Now I read any, if there's any scandal going on in America. I trust the foreign press more than I trust our press. Well, isn't it stunning that there's a picture of, you know, uh, the claim has been for a long time that the Epstein-Clinton relationship only really began after Clinton left office. Yeah. And then you have a picture contradicting that and it doesn't get any coverage. So how does... There's something I, I, else there, I, obviously. I was shocked to learn from you that Ron Brown, I, I remember, he was a guy who was on a plane going someplace. Croatia. Yeah, Croatia. And it crashed, and, and everybody was like, it's another Clinton murder. And I've never really bought into the, I mean, you wouldn't have to push me far, but I'm a fact guy, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, Show yeah. me the facts. Um, well, it's I a lot to unravel to understand the Ron Brown situation because it's tied up with that what I mentioned earlier, Chinagate, which was uh, very difficult even for Congress to investigate. Uh, the man at the center of it, who was also the man that Jeffrey Epstein met with repeatedly at the White House, named uh, Mark Middleton, he pleaded the fifth 28 times, including uh, to the question is, was he a foreign agent? And pretty much every key figure they tried to subpoena uh, also pleaded the fifth. And there was just... Um, you know, very, very, it was very difficult to investigate. And even uh, the George W. Bush administration, uh, the first invocation of executive privilege of Bush as president was, among other things, to block documents about Mark Middleton being made available to Congress. And then 9-11 happens and everyone forgets. Wow. It's, it's very amazing because Mark Middleton was not a high ranking guy. He was uh, an aide to uh, Mac McClarty, who was chief of staff and then a senior advisor to Bill Clinton. So why are you having the subsequent president Correct. stepping in for Mark Middleton? There's obviously a lot going on there because at the same time uh, that um, Mark Middleton is involved in Chinagate, he's meeting with Jeffrey Epstein and Jeffrey Epstein in that period of time is arranging for the relocation of Southern Air Transport, the Iran-Contra airline, from instead of uh, going from Miami to Latin America, it starts going from Columbus, Ohio, where Leslie Wexner is based, uh, to Hong Kong. So are those events connected? I make a case for that in the book. And if, if true, it's very, very disconcerting because basically, you know, to summarize Chinagate, you have a mass transfer of sensitive U.S. military technology yeah. being made to China. It's being paid for by the PLA or the, the Chinese mm -hmm. military. And uh, Ron Brown was at the center of that because the Commerce, Depart uh, Commerce Department was signing off on, you know, all sorts of. Uh, and so why was he then? supposedly killed he uh shortly before he was uh unexpectedly asked to go on a trade mission to croatia he agreed to cooperate with an investigation into this particular network that was executing china gate oh, and the people on the u.s side that were uh facilitating china gate uh were people that were uh, connected to the networks of longtime clinton benefactors the riati family and mm. jackson stevens who you know were sort of political king mac, uh, makers for uh, Bill Clinton when he was governor of Arkansas. It's how much crazy. Of, <laughs> how much of what we think we know is wrong, or how big of a role is what we think we know to what really is happening? Well, I think there's been a major effort to control the media and how much information gets to the American public about all sorts of things. If right. you look at the Epstein case, you're only allowed to talk about his sex crimes from 2000 to 2006. Uh, don't look at his financial crimes or any of the thing he did before the year 2000 is, you know, pretty much how mainstream media handles the case. And that's pretty, so, you know, there's a lot to find if you go, go back farther. So when you're you're looking, let's just look at Epstein for a second. When you're looking at his circle of influence, he is somebody who's kind of recruiting, just getting people on tape doing horrible things or raising money so they're in the pocket. 
right? Is that kind of his role? I think that's part of it. But at the same time, you know, he's doing a lot of that. He's also involved in financial, you know, financial crimes pretty much throughout his career. I mean, that's the common thread from Epstein from the 70s right. until his but second arrest. But they would arrest, know really. that if he was working <clears throat> as an operation, that would kind of be over. I think it was right? known. I mean, even in January 2020, you have John McCain's wife, Cindy McCain, saying we all knew what Epstein was doing. Right. And this is the wife of a senator with no direct connection to the Epstein scandal. So that means top people in our Congress and Senate knew knew what Epstein was up to and nothing was done. And so does that, I mean, is there a big body count? Around Epstein? Yeah. I think, yeah, I think there is to an extent. Uh, Mark Middleton, who I just mentioned, was found uh, hung by the neck by an extension cord in May with a shotgun wound to the chest. Um, And it was ruled a suicide in Little Rock, (laughs) Arkansas. And uh, a local court ruled uh, pretty shortly thereafter that no video or, you know, photos Mm -hmm. of the scene could be publicly released. And this was only after... You know, Mark Middleton had been involved in China Gate and numerous other scandals, but that only happened just a few months after the visitor logs of him meeting with Epstein was released uh, last December and published by the UK's Daily Mail. So that's one. But you- That's one recently. You also have Jean-Luc Brunel, who was a major uh, facilitator of his uh, sex trafficking activities, particularly when it came to the modeling industry, um, turned up dead in his prison cell. You have Epstein himself, and then you have uh, the son of Esther Salas, who was a, the judge overseeing the Epstein Deutsche Bank case, mm. uh, murdered at uh, her home. Let's not just gloss over Epstein uh, and his death. Do you believe... He hung himself? I think the official story is just, uh, I mean, it's, it's crazy, uh, personally, because, you know, he, he was a tall guy. He's supposed to have hung himself from something that's shorter than his standing height with, like, paper-thin sheets. He would have had to curl up in the fetal position to hang himself, and he's, you You're know. You're not going to do that. It's, it's very, uh, it's logistically impossible. We're supposed to leave all the cameras malfunction that night, um, you know, the, the prison guards were asleep. It's a lot of coincidences. Um, so who would, who, who would we have to believe? I mean, that would have to involve lots of government. Lots of sure. government. Sure, but he belonged to intelligence. Uh, and if you look at, you know, someone like Robert Maxwell, he died off of his yacht. Uh, he had a lot of ties to intelligence. Things were, you know... The walls were closing in on him, and his own daughter, Ghislaine Maxwell, thinks he was murdered uh, by uh, rogue Mossad agents and Sicilian contract hitmen. And that's coming straight from his daughter that worked closely with him. So if you, you know, if things get too hot, if you, you know, uh, maybe work did work for them in the past, but you become, you know, more of a liability than an asset, you know, things sometimes happen. I don't believe in the Pizzagate conspiracy you know that there's an underground however i i do think that there is real evil at the upper levels that yeah we've been engaging in and all of us dupes out in the center of the country are like oh no they, you know they, i how, how much how prevalent is the massive corruption and the evil with Well, like I mentioned earlier, the more you look at the people that were around Epstein, even before Epstein gets involved, it becomes very clear that what he was doing was not uh, out of the ordinary for these particular groups, especially like arms dealers like Adnan Khashoggi. He had an alleged harem of women that he used to blackmail Mm. powerful people in the private and public sectors on his yacht um, and all their sorts of types of people. Um, uh, Robert Keith Gray, a PR executive that uh, started working for Adnan Khashoggi around the same time Jeffrey Epstein allegedly did, has an alleged history of sexual blackmail for the CIA. And then you have allegations of uh, Roy Cohn, the well-known New York mob attorney, also being involved in sexual blackmail stuff, begins uh, working for Adnan Khashoggi in the same period of time in the 1980s. Uh, I mean, there are, the more you look, it's, it's quite uh, it's prevalent. But, you know, how prevalent it is, I can't really say, but it definitely does influence our politics, and that's disturbing. Is the, is the Clinton Foundation involved in 
any of this? It just is- so um, I don't know exactly. Um, you know those types of activities. I have no evidence for that, and I haven't looked into it. So I'm not going to say it's not happening, but I I just don't know because I haven't looked. Right. Um, but when you like I mentioned earlier about the Epstein Clinton relationship, he goes from Ponzi schemes to Clinton fundraising. Then he's involved with a lot of the 1996 controversial fundraisers that were investigated by mm-hmm. Congress. Clinton leaves office. He's flying around in Epstein's plane, setting up the Clinton Foundation and the Clinton Health Act access initiative and even credits Jeffrey Epstein back in 2003 with designing a lot of the philanthropy that became the Clinton Foundation, specifically the HIV AIDS program. So you have a serial financial criminal creating basically the Clinton political slush fund post-presidency. The um, have you seen any connections in um, Ukraine? There's this is just the hotbed of a lot of really nefarious players. Yeah. Um, I haven't looked into it specifically because a lot of my timeline that I did for the book, you know, stops before, th- um, years like 2014 when there was this, you know, basically a coup, um, you know, with Victoria Newland and some of these people from the Obama yeah, yeah. administration and all of that. Um, so unfortunately, you know, I haven't personally explored that, but I think it's, <laughs> I mean, even mainstream media before the recent, uh, conflict there was, you know, pretty open about the corruption in, in Ukraine. So I don't know your politics and it's not important to me. What's important to me is your character and your work, uh, which is phenomenal. Um, But uh, I'm guessing you and I don't necessarily agree on policies. Uh, you know, we maybe might. I don't know. I just, okay. you know, at this point, I think my politics are I'm I don't want the government to be run by organized crime. That's what I, <laughs> and that's, that, I think that's, that's a starting where, point for most Americans. Let's start there. Right. You know, that, I, that's what, what I was driving to is. There are big things on the table that no one's talking about. And we're all that, focused on the little stuff the they've little used stuff. to divide and conquer us this right. whole time. And big things are happening. And basically, we are being herded into a, Pen. a techno-feudalism, yes. slavery. I don't know. A lot of, There's a lot of different names for it going around, but it's not good. Right. And it's organized crime, you know, running the show. At the highest levels. And also <coughs> evil. I mean, yeah. it's just getting so dark. And, yeah. it, you know, I'm, I'm to the point where, can, can you give me nine of the top 10 bill of rights you know what i mean do you agree with those give me something anything that is they're foundational being they're away. all being yeah. destroyed all mm-hmm. of them they don't mean anything anymore but those are the things that can bring us together and they do i mean i'm sure you're called a radical conspiracy theorist um you know there's a difference between conspiracy theory and conspiracy facts sure. so i would call you conspiracy fact purveyor yeah uh i guess so because conspiracy is a real crime and it's happening and it's been happening right and um you know a lot of us are sort of fed this you know when we're in school and stuff sort of this naive i guess you could call it a fairy tale version of history where there's no corruption everything's fine the mob disappeared decades ago nothing to see here but that's uh, not the real history of this country tell me before we leave Epstein, tell me why uh, Maxwell's alive. Oh, oh, I think it's pretty obvious. Uh, she's going to cooperate with the people that supported that operation, and she's not going to spill anything. She got moved from the prison where I think she was at the same prison where Epstein died, mm-hmm. uh, and now she's at what is, has been described as a country club prison in Florida. Uh, that wouldn't have happened unless she was like, yeah, just leave me alone, please. I'll do whatever you want. All right, let's let's uh, I think she knows from her father's death who not to double cross and who runs the show. Yeah. Um, How does this involve the regular person? Why should the regular person care about this kind of corruption? Um, In just talking about Epstein, the financial crimes uh, there are very significant and are just sort of a microcosm of what has basically been the looting of the American public for decades. You look at people like Catherine Austin Fitz and Mark Skidmore, who have calculated about $21 trillion of U.S. taxpayer money that's just gone missing uh, from from, uh, the House of uh, Urban Development and uh, the Department of Defense. Right. It's probably more than that. Where is it being... Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Yeah. Who took it? 
I, I remember. And uh, it's still happening. And now we're having uh, the standard of life in the U.S. being degraded. Inflation's increasing. The squeeze is on thanks to manufactured food and energy crises. And I think um, a lot of the stuff we're seeing being built for us, people are currently perhaps unwilling to accept. But when they're cold and hungry and desperate, you're exactly right. I think that some people will be more willing. <sighs> You're not improving my mood much. <laughs> well, you know, it's um, we have to understand what we're facing in order to, um, you know, solve it. Right. And a How lot of people deal with uh, it. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been ringing this bell for gosh, almost 20 years now and saying, wake up, pay attention. Look what's yeah. happening. And it just keeps getting more and more obvious. And at times there are times you're just like, I, I, how do you deal with it? Um, well, I'm a mother, um, and I just, uh, I have to keep going. I don't know. I have to keep saying something because my kids are going to live in this world. Right. And there's certain things that I just find unacceptable. And I think every parent yeah. probably does at this point. So, you know, it doesn't really matter anymore. Um, and I think also if you're looking at this from like the energetic spiritual level, it matter, you know, um, we have to keep fighting yeah. because what's the alternative and what does that mean for us even yeah. after we're gone? Yeah. Right. So let me, uh, you know, I first ran into you, um, and your work. I don't remember where I saw you, but you were talking about transhumanism mm -hmm. and this is something that, again, I, I think I was talking about this in the nineties and saying it's been going on a long time, a so, long, yeah. long time, mm -hmm. and saying that this is what it, life is going to head towards, and it's not good. And we should probably have a conversation now. You know, <laughs> we are on the verge of this. This yes. is happening. It it could faster happen. than ever. Yeah, yeah, it could happen mm -hmm. twenty, twenty five, thirty, thirty five. It's here now. Yeah. Explain what transhumanism is and why it is so dangerous. Yeah, so I'll just uh, probably start with the history of it. Um, so there was a man named Julian Huxley. He's the brother of the famous author Aldous Huxley. He was president of the British Eugenics Society. The United <laughs> Nations is created um, after World War II. He is put in charge of UNESCO. In writing his vision for UNESCO, Julian Huxley says about eugenics, we need to make the unthinkable thinkable again. Ten years later, he coins the term transhumanism in a book Did called- Did he read his brother's work? Um, I'm sure actually that Aldous Huxley's work was influenced by the type of social milieu he inhabited, which okay. would include his, his, his brother, brother. Okay. and uh, you know, sort of that those intellectual circles yeah, yeah. Uh, where both of them grew up, right? right? Okay. You know, this is the British aristocracy mm -hmm. and really a lot of the idea of eugenics going back to Francis Galton and, you know, Darwinism yep. and all of that, it te seems to sort of emanate from, from their Fabian socialists and yes. all of that. Yes. Um, so in, in a book in 1957, I believe, called uh, New Bottles for New Wine, something like that, uh, Julian Huxley coins the terms transhumanism and talks about how the new eugenics is going to be merging uh, man with machine. So this is basically eugenics rebranded, and a lot of people that funded eugenics causes of the past, like the Rockefeller family, are mm -hmm. you know big proponents of transhumanism today and it's it's getting uh, increasingly problematic um i would say you know if you look for example at the new head of the fda who very few people have bothered to look into um, robert caliph he's a former google health executive uh, google health has a joint venture venture with GlaxoSmithKline hmm. uh, called galvani bioelectronics i think the former head of that was monsef salawi who was in charge of operation warp speed and their focus is what they call bioelectronics medicine, which is, uh, you know, injectable nanotechnology that right. can manipulate your central nervous system. What are the implications of that? We have the person that uh, just purchased Twitter making a brain chip company. Mm -hmm. He's also a major contractor to the U.S. military. He has a major conflict of interest uh, with uh, Chinese uh, Silicon Valley equivalents like Tencent. Um, and, you know, he says, and I love this. He says, that's one of the reasons why I want to get off the planet. He says his work is to find a way to a compete against the transhumanistic, you know, no. folly. Um, uh, you don't believe that at all. I don't. I don't yeah. buy it. No. Uh, okay. If you look at 
that company, they had animal trials. Many of the, of the monkeys it was tested and died after the brain chip was yeah. put in. If that were my company, I would reformulate everything or shut it yeah. down if it was going to kill that many animals. But it's already moved into human trials. <laughs> I mean, it's, even though it's killing all the monkeys, well, it killed many monkeys. Yeah, yeah, I forget the exact number, but a significant portion. It's see, I, uh, this is where it gets frightening. Well, it's I, tied up with depopulation, right? You have this being sort of the new uh, path of eugenics, and so you know, I don't think these people ultimately care about you know how many God, uh, so people are left. Smart right? Smart and right. Well, eugenics Thank is you. <laughs> I mean, well, people like to act like eugenics disappeared and it hasn't. It's mm -mm. just rebranded. And if you look at the history, it's it's very clear and it's very disconcerting. That's why everything you're seeing that is coming out of policy all over the world, every, all of the all of the world economic forms well, seems so look Malthusian. At Canada, the, the medically assisted death originally it was right. going to be for terminally ill people. Now people are pitching it to homeless people in Canada saying you're too poor to live. Do you want to kill yourself? Um, How do we not remember what happened last time? Well, I think some of these people, you look at the Rockefellers, they funded oh, what I happened know. last time. Yeah. A lot of that uh, money that was used to set up the Nazi eugenics program came from the Rockefeller Foundation, and that's a matter of record. They've tried to go back and say, oh, we're sorry, but they're yeah. funding a lot of this stuff now. You've read IBM and the Holocaust? Uh, I haven't read it, but I'm familiar with yeah. the relationship so, there. Um, he's a good, dear friend of mine. And, uh, you know, it's the same thing. It's the same thing now. Giant corporations are in bed with all of this stuff. And uh, yeah. someday they'll be hiding it and go, no, 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 we didn't do anything with that. But I don't know. If, well, I, don't I don't think know if they you... even have to now. I mean, if it really gets to the transhumanist point and they can just manipulate, um, you know, this is an attempt to manipulate consciousness. Yes. Really, uh, really. So and memory and all of that. I mean, they don't have to <laughs> even bother with it anymore uh, once it gets to that point. I talked to Ray Kurzweil once and, and I said, you put the nanotech down. Just tell me out here, Ray. I'm a science fiction writer. You put the nanotechnology into me and you control it. Not me. You control it. And I start speaking out about things that you and the powerful don't like. Why don't you just turn me off? Why don't you just, oh, you know what? And all that nanotechnology and I just die. Sure. And his response was. Because we wouldn't do that. Yeah, let's trust us. <laughs> yeah. How has that gone for the you know past hundred years or right. so? Right. And if organized crime are the people in charge, are you going to trust them? I mean, they want us to trust in, uh, them. If you look at the World Economic Forum or even the Biden administration um, and a lot of their policy documents, their one of their main focuses uh, are rebuilding trust with the public, and it's not working. Yeah, it's not. But it's they may be looking at drastic interventions to make it work. And I think you know, if we're transhumanism to uh, be shorehorned, uh, shorehorned, uh, shoehorned through, you know, that could happen. And if you're seeing this, um, you know, the sort of these mergers, uh, cause there's many of them of Silicon Valley companies and, and big pharma, you know, they're framing it as healthcare, but it's eugenics being framed as healthcare. And it's, uh, it's really terrifying. I, I mean, it's terrifying. It's crazy. There's a lot of words for it, but you know, ultimately uh, it has to be stopped. And unfortunately COVID has set this precedent where it can be mandatory or where you can lose your livelihood, where you can, you know, not be able to travel. You can basically be placed under house arrest unless you agree well, to it. If you don't, I mean, in the grand scheme of uh, where we've all been upgraded, we're all part of the internet. upgraded. Yeah, I, know. I don't think that's the intention. That's how they're selling it to people. If you look at this, for example, the British Eugenics Society, where a lot of this came came from, you look at someone like H.G. Wells, best known as a science fiction writer, but also a avowed eugenicist. He mm -hmm. predicted that in a uh, hundred to two hundred years, there would be two human races. There would be the um, upgraded, augmented elite exactly who were intellectual right. and attractive and, you yep. know, were the ones that did everything. And then a dwarf-like, troll-like, squat underclass that eats bugs. 
<laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, for people that have been paying attention, it, it seems like, you know, they're selling this as, as one way. It's all going to be a utopia, uh, utopian uh, thing if we all upgrade. I mean, that's how it's being framed, right? But if you look at how these people think, they don't want that. They're looking at feudalism and how do you create a yep. class of slaves that cannot even cognitively rebel ever again. It is why, I mean, it, you know, these teachers unions said, oh, we, we care about, you know, minorities and everything else. They did more damage to a whole generation of minorities more than they did Just white kids. kids in but general. they put kids yeah. in general into the yeah. into the gears of the machine. I live in South America. The lockdowns there were brutal. Uh, everyone was under house arrest, basically. You were only allowed to, out of your house twice a week with papers that you had to show to police. Each uh, paper was good for, like, roughly three hours. And uh, my daughter goes to daycare. Um, she's four, and she was, thankfully, you know, shielded from a lot of this and was able to have interaction and stuff. But a lot of kids weren't. And a lot of kids her age and younger are nonverbal. Uh, they scream. Like, instead of talking, mm -hmm. I mean, they can, they're, it's, it's, it's devastating. And the fact that these people, you know, act like it was for the children or for public health when, you know, the evidence increasingly comes out and it wasn't, you know, it was... It was for something else. And I think we're, you know, it's increasingly becoming clear what that something else is and was. What we're doing to farming, the, 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 the ESG and World Economic Forum plan is evil. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, it, it seems an overused word, and it's one I swore off about five years ago. I said, I don't want to call things evil because it, it has to be evil is a different level. But when you're talking about controlling and dumbing down and enslaving and destroying, I don't know what other word to use for it. And they've yeah. gotten away with saying this, this is conspiracy theory, conspiracy theory. Well, they just, you know, I think that's, you know, since the, the term really entered the American vernacular uh, after the assassination of John F. Kennedy, it's been used to basically claim that if you think powerful people get together to discuss how to advance their power um, and keep it um, at the expense of everyone else, uh, that they have any agency, um, you know. You're crazy. It all, it all has to be a coincidence. You know, they have they never have any bad intentions. The people that, you know, are the oligarchs that, you know, fund our politicians and have ties with intelligence and have monopolies and, you know, uh, the technology that runs our lives and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, it's um, you know, I think at this point you have to be quite naive to think that's actually the case. But um, so how do people like the um, uh, new governor, I think, of Alberta, uh, is standing up against ESG. And the first thing, one of the first things she said was, anybody that brags about how they have controls and people in every government uh, uh, leader's office, if not the leader themselves, I don't think we should be doing any business with them. And ESG and World Economic Forum is out. Um, how does somebody like that survive somebody like Klaus Schwab? You know, I think, um, you know, it's not just Klaus Schwab. I think Klaus Schwab is sort of a man who is there to facilitate. I mean, it, it, let's talk about the World Economic Forum for a second and what it is and what it's not. They describe themselves as the premier promoter of public-private partnerships. Um, for lack of a better word, that is fascism. fascism. So, um and then you have the family history of Klaus Schwab, that his father ran a Nazi model company and funded the atomic bomb and all of that, and uh, just very complicated stuff there. And uh, you basically have him being in this position where he's promoting, uh, you know, fascism on a global scale. I mean, he's a, a, a white kitty cat away from being a James Bond super. Well, I, but I think that's, you know, <laughs> they want everyone to focus on him and think yeah. that it's just him and just the World Economic Forum. There's other organizations that sure. are promoting this, too. And also a lot of the, you know, the Young Global Leader Program, that's not exclusive mm -hmm. to the World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. You know, there's lots of other institutions with similar um, agendas, uh, you know, that uh, sort of are 
are related to the World Economic uh, Forum, which seeks, you know, not just public-private partnerships and fascism, but uh, global governance. You know, there's a lot of these organizations mm-hmm. seeding their people in, in certain places. Uh, so how do you, you know, fight against this? I think uh, there are sort of like factional infighting uh, to an extent. And it's really hard to know um, how that's going at any given time. Um, But there's an obvious effort um, by powerful interests to stop uh, nationalist politicians from reaching the highest levels. You think? (laughs) Yeah. uh, Well, I think it's pretty clear. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, how do they stop that? I don't know. I mean, unfortunately, you look at the World Economic Forum, a lot of the banks are very Gone. involved and when you you know are in bed with the banks and the banks are in bed with you um fine. it's it's very hard to go against that in today's world and you know they're making it uh even harder on the little people people in canada that protested with the the you know the trucker protest they were deplatformed not from social media but from the financial system and i think that's going to become increasingly common it's already happening to a lot of people that i work with taken off of paypal uh having trouble with their uh, their sure. banks venmo i mean you know sure uh and I think that's going to, you know, become increasingly commonplace, and that's how they're going to try and force compliance. And you know, a big part of this, you have the move towards a central bank digital currency and all of that at the same time, which is programmable money. The state decides whether you save or you spend. They decide what you can and can't buy, and all this stuff. And all the central banks, even on the, you know, uh, in places like Russia, where Vladimir Putin talks a good game about nationalism and mm-hmm. protecting our culture, they're going full steam ahead with that too. It's the way you control a population yeah and i think all these governments are really interested right now in domestic control so what does america look like at the end china that is the goal of a lot of people at the highest levels of silicon valley in our government i would say look no oh sure i i i I have friends who are industrialists and they would say to me 30 years ago china is the new model and i thought that's a bad model. We don't want that. And they would just flippantly just say, China is the new model. It wasn't until 10 years later that I started going, wait a minute. They mean that sincerely, that how it works there, all of it is coming here. Yeah. That's, That's terrifying. been planned for a long time. We talked about China Gate earlier. The origins of Silicon Valley are in that whole mix. And a lot of the most powerful people in our military industrial com- uh, complex, including like Lockheed Martin, were involved with that and wanted that sensitive technology to go to China um, and undermine our national security. They're looking there's something there was something going on there then. And I think we're increasingly seeing it now. Um, I wrote an article in 2020 about the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. They basically say that in order to uh, be competitive in artificial intelligence and secure economic and military hegemony for the United States, we have to go beyond China in terms of their implementation of uh, surveillance technology, um, the use of artificial Mm -hmm. intelligence, moving away from private car ownership, which they refer to Mm -hmm. as a legacy system, in-person doctor visits uh, to the AI-powered alternative. This was Mm -hmm. in 2019, before COVID. COVID comes along. Two years before that, I talked to the chairman of the board at General Motors, and he told me by 2030, we won't be making cars as you know them today. We'll be making fleets. Yeah, because people it's won't Uber. Be having, yeah. uh, it's, uh, you know, it, Ubers you rent and you can't control where they go. Correct. And they're only going to be in the smart cities. You're not going between cities anymore. Mm-hmm. No more road trips. Uh, no more, you know, you decide, oh, I want to go over here today. I want to drive three hours to see my family or whoever, my friends. That's that's over if these people win. And the National Security Commission on AI was run by Eric Schmidt, former head of Google. Uh, one of the the co-chair was a very uh, top guy that works closely with Schmidt mm-hmm. that uh, was at the Department of Defense. And it's uh, the intelligence community, the military mm-hmm. and Silicon Valley. And those are the people uh, increasingly running the show. And they think if we don't uh, go beyond China's surveillance uh, system and mega city smart city model, um, we will fail. And then you have people like Elon Musk coming in and saying, I want to take over Twitter for free speech. And then he also says, I want to make Twitter into basically like WeChat, which is, you know, a, a basically a surveillance app to use in China. That's for uh, your finances, your social media, all, pretty much everything is on that app. They even call it the everything app. And that's his model. And 
the parent company of that, Tencent, is uh, one of uh, Tesla's uh, shareholders and, you know, most active advisors. So is that data going to stay, you know, that he's going to get from Twitter, the new Twitter, when it becomes a WeChat equivalent? Is Where's that going to go? I mean, there's a lot. If you look at... Um, you know, the China connection here, it's, you know, when I was writing, before I wrote the book, I didn't realize the extent of the overlap, but it's very concerning. Uh, you have people with major conflicts of interest running our national security policy on things like AI that have conflicts of interest with China. And they, you know, Eric Schmidt just wrote a, a book with Henry Kissinger, and these guys mm -hmm. basically argue in order to avoid a war, a cataclysmic war with China, we have to make good and cooperate with China. And the model for that is basically, you know, the World Economic Forum. I mean, they argue the same thing, uh, global governance and technocracy um, following the China model here. And it's very uh, against every everything most Americans are accustomed to, uh, but they're, I, I guess, finding ways to manufacture consent for it, whether the justification is climate change, it's COVID, it's a food and energy crisis that's been manufactured. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whatever they can, whatever will stick, they'll use. But the, the problem is you're having the people that control Silicon Valley behind this. They control where most people get their information, where most people socialize today. And they're increasingly censoring people from platforms. Uh, they're waging basically a war on dissent uh, that I've written about a few times. And it's getting, you know, increasingly Orwellian to the point where, you know, they'll label you misinformation or, you know, this is disinformation. Uh, but, you know, the Biden administration, if their war on domestic terror advances the way they've written it out, uh, you say the wrong thing or you disagree with the state even or the official narrative, you're, uh, you know, inciting violence. You're potentially right. a domestic violent extremist. Right. Um, and that's happened in history before, not necessarily in the United States, but other countries. And, you know, it's pretty clear that once that type of policy gets implemented, things go downhill very quickly. Do you have hope at all that the if the Republicans could win it at least slows it down. I mean, I think people in the Republican, there's, there's clearly people who go to Washington and actually believe it and then are turned uh, or they go to Washington, they're already a dirt bag and they know what they're getting into. Yeah. And then there's a few that go and stand and are trying to hold the line. But they're a minority. A big minority. Or they get forced out. Correct. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Ron Johnson, right? Mm -hmm. um, was the one that, that challenged a lot of COVID narratives. Yes. And I mean, even mainstream media, NPR, supposed to be objective, says, yeah. oh, he spreads conspiracy theories and his challenger's a rising star. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. you know, I mean, they're very clear about who they favor and who they don't. And if they don't want you to win, they'll gerrymander your district. They'll do some, I mean, there's lots of tools and that they can use to uh, prevent you from from staying in office and who knows what we'll uh, see in the midterm elections. Uh, but ultimately, you know, it, those type of people that are willing to stand their ground and actually fight for the American people are very few. Um, even in, it doesn't really matter what party you're talking about. It's very small number when you consider the amount of votes needed to pass certain <laughs> legislation. Yeah. Um, so I think ultimately, uh, the way out of this is for the American people to realize that we, yes, this is a fight between good and evil, but if you're looking for the good guys, stop looking at people that are put on the TV screens in front of you yeah. and start looking at your neighbors. Yeah. And this the is, answer is so clear. Local. Local, yeah. local, 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 yes, local. Absolutely. And this is really us versus them. It's not left versus right anymore. Yes. We are so <laughs> far beyond that. Yeah. Uh, really. And, and it's amazing and very heartening how many people that I know and I interview that um, we would have we would have been against each other 15 years ago. We would say, oh, you're. Uh, and now it's like, no, 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 no. Forget all of forget all of that. Yeah. You know, and it's heartening that people are waking and starting to come together. Question is, do we make it fast enough? I, I've been saying for a while, this is going to be a photo finish. I, I don't know which one's going to. I don't think anyone really does. And I think it comes down to how much responsibility people are willing to take for their own lives and, and you know, how, how far communities are willing to go to ensure right. that they're self-reliant in the what face of what we're facing. What does that mean to you? 
well, if the banks are deplatforming people, you can't use their financial system. Are right. you going to go to the CBDC land where eventually you won't be able to spend money without like a, a, ch- a microchip in your hand and all of this right. stuff? Um, you know, there's obvious red lines people can't cross. How are you going to feed your family? How are you going to keep your house heated in winter? Uh, you know, basic needs. I think uh, we should probably be taking some lessons from the Amish, to be honest. I think. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I think I've they got saying that stuff lately, right. That the Amish. They're going to be fine. They're going to be fine. We have. We have outsourced everything. our needs to corporations that want to enslave us. So we have to uh, start producing our own stuff at a local level. It's all about exit and build. And that's what we have to do. And the more people that do that, um, the better off we will be. The real question is how uh, accustomed are Americans to convenience and will we be enslaved by that convenience or not? And I think that's the ultimate. So far we have been. A lot of people have been. Yeah. Um, Talk to me a little bit about Bitcoin. Um, So I'm, you know, not necessarily... um, uh, well versed on cryptocurrency, I do. Um, uh, I I like Bitcoiners because uh, we tend to have a lot, see a lot in common about um, you know the state of government today and uh, the Federal Reserve, for example, central bank, central bank digital currency, um, and all of that. But you know, because I'm not particularly well versed in it, I don't like to tell people how to spend their money. It's a very right, individual right. decision. Um, do you so, think it can survive? Uh, I think the central banks, the bankers, and the government will do everything they can to prevent a currency that threatens their power from right. actually being able to be used. And I think we're already seeing uh, major efforts to make that the case. You know, they can make it illegal to, uh, you know, turn it into something else, illegal to use as tender. You know, they, they're looking at a lot of different options. Um but, you know, some Bitcoiners, despite that, think it's totally possible, but I don't think I'm qualified to talk about yeah, that. Um, you know, I personally have, you know, um, in terms of my finances, like, you know, some people donate to my work in crypto. I have a little bit of that. But, you know, I'm personally looking at trying to put as much of my money as I can and things that will keep me and my family self-sufficient come what may, uh, which in my case included like investing in land. So I'm not renting. I own where I live. I have enough land to produce what my family Mm -hmm. needs in terms of food, uh, stocking up on things that I can't produce, you know, things like that. That's where my money is personally going. But I am not in the business of telling people, you know, giving financial advice beyond that. But, you know, if the goal is to have developed parallel systems so we're not dependent on the systems of the people trying to enslave us, you know, uh, whatever you think is a good way to get from point A to point B, uh, you know, that's probably where your money should be going. If Bitcoin's a part of that, if you feel that way, good for you. And if not, you know, good for you, too. I think ultimately uh, what we need to do is... um, uh, try and create something so that we can be resilient and not have to, uh, I mean, cause the system is just so unacceptable. Uh, I mean, it's an, it's really not just in, in it's not just against freedom and, and all sorts of other values, right? It's just, it's against nature. It's against it life really. And yeah. so, I mean, if you're going to support that, you know, I think people have to realize the consequences that come with that and exactly what it means when you are are willing to give yourself over that kind of system the implications of that and i think a lot of people don't really realize that or take the time to think about it and i think they should are you god driven is god a center of you yeah but i tend to think of maybe god differently than most christians i don't really see it as a person or as a man i see it as uh maybe the universe or the creative force right uh you know uh, the energy uh, that I drives can go all with life. George Lucas and the Force. I mean, right. it's the There's same a lot principle. of different ways, yeah. you know, to look at it. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, if you're looking at humanity, what do you like about humanity? It's all the it's the creativity, mm-hmm. it's uh, the vivaciousness. You know, that's the stuff that I think we're fighting for. Uh, and you know, uh, a lot of the guys behind this want to to eliminate that. I think a lot of transhumanism is aimed at creating like a drone-like workforce that will never be able to uh, challenge their working conditions or ask for a bigger piece of the pie. And it's amazing to me that more people on on the left don't see that if they're all about workers' rights and unionizing. All right, you have a chip in your brain. How's the, how's, you know, workers' rights going to go? And how is union, how are the unions in bed 
furthering all of this. Well, I would say that you just have to look back to uh, the unions, you know, back in the 20s and 30s and 40s and how organized crime took them over. And it hasn't really changed. Um, so the big ones, I mean, you know. Um, so it's, um, you know, a lot of those guys over the years have evolved to uh, support these types of of policies because it's more control and money. And what does the mob love more than anything else, right? What, why is the left you know, I've always held libertarian, more libertarian views. When it comes to social issues, I don't care who you marry. I don't care what you do. I don't care who you love. That's no, no business of mine. Shouldn't be any business of the government. You know, mm -hmm. that was a progressive idea to have a marriage license from the government. Um, but we fought this. And I remember saying to my, my daughter, who was in college at the time, she said, Dad, it's about love. And I said, I don't think it is. I think it's about control and uh, this argument. If we play it out, you can't stop polygamy. You can't change one factor without changing other factors. And everyone said these things were crazy. We, we are now transitioning kids because there's no gender identity anymore. We are sexualizing our youngest kids. What, where is that coming from? It's so, such a force. If your ultimate goal is total control, you need to have a, a population that has no national identity, that has no identity period, that that identity can be fluxed and can be moved uh, whenever convenient for the people on top. If people have an identity and know who they are and know where they stand, they're a lot harder to control. And I think if you make all of that fluid, um, at every level, uh, it's a lot easier to uh, exert your will over them because, you know, they, they don't have their feet firmly on the ground, right? I thought of this several times during this podcast. I think this is the most empowerful interview I've ever done. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I hope people listen and open their mind enough to go, that can't be true. I mean, I usually start my investigations on things going, no way, it can't be. I don't do that as often now because I'm seeing, oh yeah, it probably is. <laughs> yeah. Um, <coughs> did, did, who were you before you started doing this? Who, I mean, did you believe these things? Or have you found these things going, oh, my gosh, and one leads to another? Well, I guess you could say that when I was younger and in my teen years, I had a major trust issue with adults. Um, mm. And I just uh, had a hard time. I just didn't believe what I was told a lot of the time. I had to figure it out for myself and all sorts of things. I guess that's sort of uh, a lot of some teenagers um, are like that. But I... Um, you know, around the time I was in university the last year or two, I sort of figured out um, a lot of things about um, American history that's sort of hidden from us. Um, uh, the government it isn't exactly there to help necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how we went from, hey, government is like fire with George Washington saying, if you're in control of it, it's good. If it's out of control, it'll burn you to, hey, we're from the government. We'll educate your kids. How could you possibly think a government is going to raise kids who say, be skeptical of us? Yeah, well, it, um, it's not, you know, look at who has taken over our education system. You go back to things like uh, the Rockefeller family or their role in health care. There's a lot of oligarch families that have very specific agendas that have really taken over government policy. And it's been like that for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And they're not elected. No one put them in charge. Actually, a lot and of people used to hate the Rockefeller family right. until, uh, you know, they started a major PR campaign to rebrand themselves as mm -hmm. philanthropists that a lot of uh, other unpleasant people have mm -hmm. since followed. Um, and, uh, you know, the long term consequences of that we are seeing today. Um, but anyway, um, in terms of my background, you know, I was, you know, 21, 22 and just looking around, you know, I'm 33, so I'm a millennial. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, most people my age just, you know, I could see a lot of this stuff like um, 
we're too dependent on corporations that have a lot of nasty uh, agendas or do bad things. There's a, a lot of issues, a lot of illegal wars, no accountability at the highest levels mm -hmm. of government. You know, if people my age don't start doing something, it's going to get really bad. Uh, and most, you know, er, er, most people are like, stop talking about that. I have Netflix and beer, so I don't care. Everything's fine as long as, you know, I'm comfortable, basically, you know, screw your politics or screw your concerns. And I just uh, then wait, I left how, uh, the U.S. How, after that. How can these same group of people, that generation, claim that? No, you have to be an activist. You have to be involved in climate change. And, you know, I'm going to sit down and glue myself to a wall like a moron. Uh, you know. Yeah. Well, that's the activism that's put in front of young people today. And they're being told that's what activism is and that, that that's the activism that's sort of in vogue because it's shown and treated by mainstream media as sticking it to the man. Right. These people throwing <laughs> tomato soup on paintings. But you look at uh, those groups, I think they're called Just Stop Oil. Mm -hmm. uh, they're funded by the Getty and Rockefeller families. And the <laughs> Rockefeller family, you know, made their money off right. of oil. But, you know, they have a long time interest in eugenics and fu funding. Correct. Um, you know, people that basically helped create uh, this sort of new environmental movement that uh, downplays uh, pollution and plays up carbon dioxide. And that's all we should be worried about. And, you know, it's human. The biggest uh, I think the quote from the Club of Rome is the biggest enemy of humanity is man and furthering, you know, that narrative. Not that, you know, it's not the corporations that pollute or uh, even the U.S. military is you know, even by, you know, climate change metrics, the biggest contaminator of, you know, the planet and all of that. Uh, it's not about those guys. It's just about the regular people. But really what it's about is controlling how much energy people can use. And if you can mm -hmm. control how much energy a household can use, you can control their economic activity. You also control how many family, uh, how big their family can get. And I think that's ultimately uh, what it's about. It's not about the environment for these people and a lot of it is uh you know wall street driven you look at uh, the united nations a lot of the people they put in charge of uh, climate change policy you have mark carney uh, former head of the bank of england and the bank of canada i believe mm -hmm. uh he's one of the guys that came in to rescue hsbc when they were caught uh money laundering for mexican drug cartels not exactly a good guy mm -hmm. and it's very unlikely that he is driven by uh concern about the environment and then the other person is michael bloomberg former mayor of new york and uh yeah. billionaire guy and so these are the people and crafting the solutions and just like covid you don't have time to think about what we're telling you you just have to accept these solutions because if you don't something really really bad will happen and it's the same it's a sort of a similar narrative to what you know was played out with covid and everything guns cars everything yeah so you know people are being it's it's fear uh fear driven to get people to accept policies they otherwise wouldn't accept because they're told this cataclysmic event is just down the line and trust us again is uh the conclusion of that so you know uh there's people that agree with the narrative about climate change and there's people that don't and i'm not trying to really get in that space when i talk about this stuff i'm trying to point out that the solutions are coming mostly from wall street and they're things like carbon yes. markets they're right. things like debt for climate swaps which back in the day used to be debt for land swaps uh not about climate change you know mm -hmm. about other stuff um and then you have people like Larry Fink of BlackRock and Michael Bloomberg and Mark Carney coming together in something like GFAN saying, why don't we give Wall Street direct control of the IMF and the World Bank <laughs> for climate change? You know, right. how can anyone on the left that's worried about climate change sign off on that? Why don't they talk about planting trees? Why isn't Bill Gates the largest you know, like private landowner in the U.S. now planting trees like crazy if he's so worried about carbon dioxide? Um, you know, he, he poo poos the whole idea of planting trees as a way to combat climate change. It's just carbon markets and uh, going to electric vehicles and all of this stuff. But electric vehicles necessitates mass mining. Uh, and a lot of that mining is in places that use child labor or it's going to be so environmentally destructive. You uh, totally destroy the developing world, which, you know, these people on the left supposedly want to protect. You're going to totally destroy the environment. Um, I live in the south of Chile in the Andes. Uh, it's one of the only areas in Chile that's still like forested and really nice, not polluted water, any mm -hmm. of that. Most of the mining in Chile is historically in the north, which has become very polluted and uh, has a lack of water, among other things. And now the mines are starting to move south because of this demand 
for more and more minerals for, uh, you know, electric vehicles and all of that. Um, a lake that used to be used for tourism. Uh, there was uh, some mineral, I forget what it is, discovered in the lake shore. And then the water just disappears one season. And now it's ready to be mining right next to a national park. Uh, I used to live and work in Peru. Uh, they were talking about putting a uranium mine next to Machu Picchu and all wow. types of stuff. I mean, this is uh, going, the mining stuff is not being talked about. And, uh, you know, electrical vehicles are being marketed as necessary but it's going to come at a massive, massive cost. And I think that, you know, again, the environmental, uh, the environmental movement is focused on carbon dioxide. If they were really worried about the environment, they would also educate people on how destructive this type of mining is and what it does to the people who live there and the environment and including in protected areas. Um, there's a lot of species in this particular area of Chile where I live that are only there and they've, uh, you know, been there for thousands of years and they'll not exist if a lot of this mining goes forward. But if you ask people like uh, Bill Gates, for example, who has a joint venture with most of the other titans of <laughs> Silicon Valley called mm -hmm. Cobalt Metals, uh, they say all of the world's reserves of lithium, cobalt and nickel must be completely mined if we even want to get close to the electrical vehicle revolution. So that means digging up the entire Andes, including areas that are national parks right now. And uh, even if they do, with all the reserves that we know that we have, you're not going to be able to reproduce the amount of private cars in use today. It's right. going to be way less cars. And so they're just going to be, I mean, the model's already sort of been out there. They fielded it in the UK recently. You can't drive out of your district and all right. of that stuff. It's going to be much more controlled, the freedom of movement. Well, it's not really going to be freedom of movement. It's going to be controlled movement. Last question. Are you optimistic? Um, so that's a tricky question. You know, it, it, sometimes you're working and writing on this stuff. I mean, it's ups and downs. Yeah, sometimes yeah, you yeah. feel inspired. Sometimes you're like, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> you, you no just want to face palm. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, you know, but ultimately there's really no other way to be except to believe totally in a better future. Um, I mean, we have to be totally committed to that if we're going to do it and do it quickly. And, um, you know, I have a lot of hope uh, that um, Americans, when, when things get really rough, will come together, at least most of us. I think so, too. You know, um, but, you know, in, in the environment we're in right now, I think it's incumbent on everyone, no matter how small or big your platform is, to speak up about what is happening. Uh, I think we are past the time about worrying about what people say about you, about at I, work or at home I have or to tell wherever. You, I, uh, the president gave a speech last night and he, I don't remember what he was calling people. And I thought that just, that is so, I, so, I am so far beyond caring about names and labels that anybody, you know, and I, I think there are more and more people around the world that are like, I, I don't care. I don't care what you call me. I don't care, you know, what you do. I, I just know what's true. And I'm just not going there with you. Well, the government wants to define what is true and what is not. I wrote a recent article um, about that uh, in explaining some of the calls to basically, uh, uh, make it such um, and it's it's you know even if they try and do that and they try and say this is the state you know the state is defining truth and if you deviate from that you are inciting violence um, and all of that but the problem is people at a visceral level gravitate toward the truth mm -hmm. so they hear it and they're like oh that makes sense or they look at the sourcing Mm -hmm. or they investigate for themselves and they realize what is true and what is not. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the state and Silicon Valley, there's really not that much space yeah. between them, to be honest, right. at this point. Um, you know, they can try and, and censor and manipulate and, and whatever, but ultimately people are, are going to gravitate towards what is true. And there's going to be a point where they're not going to be able to really, the tools they have now will not work. And I think a lot of that is uh, that time will come once people <laughs> stop trying to use these platforms uh, that they are manipulating and start just going out and talking to people they know. Yep. Uh, we have to get offline and we have to do it quickly. Uh, maybe even get back, you know, in pr circulating in print stuff that's printed. I mean, mm -hmm. we really have to stop uh, depend being so dependent on these on these platforms that they're obviously manipulating. I think everyone knows about right. it or they're censoring people from um, and they're using it to profile you. You know, stop giving them your data and start getting in the real world and telling people 
uh, what's what. I mean, they may call you crazy, but the stakes are too high to not do it. That's how I feel. Thank you. <laughs> my, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.